So folks, as we get started this morning, we're going to take a few moments to quiet our hearts and our minds and to bring ourselves before God for worship. Uh, there's a centering prayer in your bulletin that you can use if you'd like to. Um, pray, God love us, Christ save us, or come before God in any way that works best for you. Let's take just a few moments. as we have lifted our hearts and our minds, I'm going to invite you to lift your voices this morning. Uh, where are the ways that we have seen God in the world around us this week? I will share one um, that is not mine, um, but I got a text from Brenda in the middle of the week. Um, she had sat by church to pick up um, I think it was the leftover treats from last week. And sitting on one of the lilac bushes on either side of the ramp on the way into the door was this cardinal. Um, she took pictures of it, and it was a very proud cardinal. I mean, he was clearly sitting there, like striking a pose because he knew somebody. I mean, he was just chest out, head up. Um, he was a very proud cardinal. Um, but cardinals are one of those things I know for a lot of people. Cardinals are a meaningful symbol between them and, and loved ones, um, and it is that way for Brenda. Cardinals have always been a meaningful symbol for her. Um, so she texted me in the middle of the week and wanted to share that. I don't think she would mind that I shared it with you all this morning. <laughs> so where else have we seen God this week? Keep thinking. <laughs> and I will invite you to rise in body or in spirit this morning. Friends, when we offer God our confession, we join the beautiful work of reconciliation, which begins with our reconciling with God. And so, trusting in our partner in grace, let us make our confession with the prayer that's in our bulletin. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses. Deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Let's take a few moments for silent reflection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Alleluia and amen. Friends, let us share the peace of Christ with one another this morning.
you. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we ask for the light of your understanding this morning. Shine it in our hearts and our minds as we hear your word, as we take it into ourselves and then take it out again into this world. And God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. when we have to pay attention to what's been left out 
as when we pay attention to what is still in. Imagine if we played a game of telephone this morning, and I gave the first person the phrase, the lake was full of rubber ducks. But somewhere along the line, I had somebody intentionally omit the word rubber. So we end up with the phrase, the lake was full of ducks. Hopefully, you never know it's telephone. The picture that you form with the final sentence, the lake was full of ducks, is a very different picture than the one with the starting sentence, the lake was full of rubber ducks, right? It's all about what gets left in and what gets left out. That is context. And what got me thinking about this critical nature of context was our scripture reading this morning. Because it contains one particular verse, I'm sure you heard it, possibly one of, if not the most well-known verse in the whole of the Bible, a verse that is almost exclusively repeated without its context, but a verse whose context really changes the whole story. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. It's well known because it's many people's favorite verse, right? Some of the most essential parts of the gospel message are in this one verse, in this one easy to memorize verse, and it's reassuring in its description of how much God loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's also well known because it's a verse that's been used by many as a gatekeeper verse, used to exclude those who don't feel people believe right, so that everyone who believes in him, in the way I believe in him, won't perish but will have eternal life. It's used as a my Jesus is better than your Jesus sort of litmus test. And if nothing else, it's well known because of the guy who used to make an appearance at so many American sporting events in the 70s and 80s, wearing his rainbow wig and holding his John 3 16 sign, right? But the context for John 3 16 is not only interesting, but crucial to the full message of the gospel. John 3 16 is embedded in this fabulous story about Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus is this funky rebel character in scripture. I love Nicodemus. The very first verse of today's text tells us that he's a Pharisee. Not exactly a term of endearment in the Gospels. Throughout all of the Gospels, it's the Pharisees and their strict legalistic interpretation of Jewish Holy Scripture, that first Testament, Testament scripture that we use, that dog Jesus and his disciples at every turn. Eventually, it's the Pharisees who will arrest and convict Jesus, who will convince Pilate to condemn him to death. And Nicodemus is one of these Pharisees. But we also have Nicodemus's admission at the beginning of today's text. Nicodemus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. And then today's text continues with Nicodemus willingly learning from Jesus. He asks all these follow-up questions, like more than one. Jesus, or Nicodemus asks a number of questions, so he's clearly genuinely interested in learning from Jesus. And then further on in the Gospel of John, Nicodemus is actually the one who argues with the Sanhedrin, with that council of Jewish leaders, against arresting Jesus. So Nicodemus is inhabiting this radical, tenuous place in our Gospel story. I think it's safe for us to guess that that's why he came to Jesus at night. So he wouldn't be seen collaborating with this countercultural, troublemaking, pot stirring rabbi. Now, the bulk of our story this morning, and I will say this John, I know I've said it before, but I have to say it again. John is one of those gospels where you could preach a whole sermon on every single verse. There is so much in John that there is stuff that we're going to get to today, and there's stuff that we're not. So that's my, that's my caveat for this morning. 
But the bulk of our story, we have Jesus trying to teach Nicodemus about the power and work of the Holy Spirit. He teaches Nicodemus about the Holy Spirit bringing new life through baptism. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I say to you, you must be born anew. We have Jesus describing the unexplainable, unpredictable nature of the movement and work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to Nicodemus, God's Spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it is going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. One of the scholars that I read this week pointed out that Jesus is playing on the Greek word pneuma, which means both spirit and wind. God's spirit is an uncontrollable and unknowable wind. The new life that Jesus has in mind is elusive, mysterious, and entirely God's doing. The incomprehensible wind of the spirit blows where we do not see, and people experience God's grace in more ways than we can understand. Now this begins to hint at why the context for that particular verse for John 3.16 is so crucial. Jesus is making it clear to Nicodemus that God's will, God's spirit, God's movement, God's call, God's grace are all wholly unpredictable and often impossible for mere humans to understand. So Nicodemus plays into this struggle to understand. In our text, he asks Jesus, how are these things possible? And Jesus' response is typical for John's gospel. It's complex, and it's cryptic, and it's complicated. He talks to Nicodemus about how impossible it is to believe heavenly things when you won't even believe earthly things. He talks to Nicodemus about how the human one came down from heaven just to be lifted up again for the sake of salvation. Again, this is that, like, there's so much in John that I can tackle all of this, but we would be here all day kind of a thing. But it's in this context of struggling to understand, in this context of a secret nighttime conversation about belief and unbelief, in this context of one being pressured by his people to believe one thing while his heart is clearly telling him another, that we find Jesus delivering that much-loved verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. But that is not the end of the story. This is the part of the context that is so important and that is almost always left out. Verse 17, the Bible doesn't end with John 3.16. There's another verse. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, the Greek here is really telling. That Greek word for judge can also mean separate. And the Greek word for save can also mean heal. So God didn't send his son into the world to separate the world, but that the world might be healed through him. Friends, it is not news to anyone that our world is nothing but separation right now. There is separation along political lines. There is separation along economic lines. There is separation along racial and ethnic lines, along religious lines, along, we could name them all day long. We have done nothing but separate ourselves into our own personal silos for too long. We have forgotten that the context of God's love coming into the world was for healing and wholeness. Not to judge us and divide us into the saved and the saved nots. Not to decide whose story matters and whose story is irredeemable. Not to decide whose love counts and whose love is an abomination. Not to decide which of Jesus' followers were Bible believers and which ones were just pretending. 
not to decide who has the right language or accent or human constructed theology or gender to speak God's word and who is not good enough. One of the scholars that I read this week said God's desire in sending God's Son is not condemnatory. Rather, it is redemptive. The whole mission and purpose of God in Christ is to rescue and recover humanity from being deeply embedded in self-defeating pursuits in a physically absorbed life. God in Christ wishes to reclaim, rename, and reauthor the stories of our lives with new life empowered by the grace of God and made manifest in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. If we are going to call ourselves Christians, if we are going to take on the work of spreading the good news of the gospel through our words and our actions and our way of being in this world, if we are indeed to declare that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life, we cannot do so without also declaring that God didn't send that beloved son into the world to judge us or condemn us or nitpick us or separate us, but to bring us salvation, to make us whole, to set us once and forever free from those things that try to tie us down, the things around us and the things inside us, to fully enfold us in that love that covers us and gives us peace. That is the part that we cannot leave out, friends, because that is the good news. Hallelujah. And amen. We have a little bit of a two-part question this morning to explore this word of God together. Does this context alter your relationship with John 3.16? I don't usually ask yes or no questions, but the follow-up for that yes or no question is if it does, how? Or if it doesn't, explain. So let us be the word of God together. Feel free to do so in your own internal, uh, introverted, contemplative time, or to talk to the people around you, or to get up and move to a different part of the sanctuary and talk to somebody else. Let us be the word of God together.
that this question or these questions or whatever questions you discuss will continue to uh, sit with you throughout the week and to encourage you and inspire you and maybe even confound you throughout the week. As we come back together, we're going to uh, sing hymn number 443, There is a Redeemer. of stars and dark holes and far-flung galaxies. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Lord of the whole creation, you are aware of each tiny creature on each planet. You pay attention to the bugs and the birds and even to us. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God of history, you call us to be your people. You appointed us to take care of this planet Earth. You gave us rules for living well together, and you call us to do great things. On this Memorial Day weekend, God, we pray especially for all those who will be marking this holiday, those who have lost loved ones in service to this country doing those great things. Be with all of us as we remember, as we honor, as we say thank you. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Loving God, you created each one of us. You know us by name and watch over us. You are with us when everything is wonderful, and you walk with us through our worst days. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
God of mercy, you know everything we do, the good and the bad, and still you do not give up on us. When we mess up, you call us back to yourself, and you forgive us. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You are greater than we can understand, vaster than we can imagine, more amazing than we can put into words. So with awe and deep gratitude, we pray the prayer that Jesus, your beloved Son, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is number 839, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
couple of, just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, there is, there are new treats sign up sheets up and I made them to go through December so we won't have to worry about new ones for a while. Um, so those are up on the bulletin board. We did not have anybody sign up today, but since it's a Memorial Day weekend, holiday weekend, and everybody's got plans, um, we're not going to worry too much about that today. Um, with the way that things go, with teachers still having to be at school, but kids not, I will be um, out of the office pretty much this week. I'll have my computer, I'll be working from home, I'll have my phone. You can get a hold of me, but I will also have my kids. So, um, just a heads up on that. Um, we will resume our renewal discussions next week. We will not be doing that today. Today is the break. Um, we will resume those after worship next week. Um, and I, as we prepare for uh, my sabbatical that starts in July, so I will still be here for a month, um, we still need some sabbatical helpers. There is a bulletin sign up list up on the bulletin board um, for how to, when to print and fold and whatnot. And we also need somebody who is willing to take care of sending out the bi-monthly um, bread sign-up list for the food shop. It's a super easy process. It's just a Google Doc that needs to be changed twice a month and emailed out to everybody. So if you are willing to do that, let me know. Those are the only announcements that I know of. Are there any others this morning? We have communion next Sunday. We do, yes. Um, and I don't remember. I know I looked at the sign-up sheet this morning, and now I don't remember if anybody was signed up for bread and helpers. Okay, perfect. All right, then I will invite you to rise in body or in spirit. As we prepare to go from this place, go with the love of God, with the peace of Jesus Christ, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit. And as we go, let us claim our faith identity as the church together. We are the church. God's beloved children, today, tomorrow, and always, here in this worship through prayer, word, and fellowship. God has embraced us yet again, and our spirits have been made new. Suffused with God's grace, we claim new strength, new purpose, and new hope in our call. With spirits reaffirmed and renewed, we are called to share God's word, we are called to show God's love, we are called to serve God's world. We are called to strive for God's peace. We are the church. Because God binds us together in sacred companionship and blessed connectedness. And now as the church, God calls us out to do and be God's extravagant love in the world. This service has ended. Now our service can begin. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.